Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. That was kind of redlining concerns to us. You know, if you're intentionally not serving black communities, you're discriminating against um, black communities and individuals. Our issue is also with the Federal Reserve and with the other banking regulators like the FDIC and the Office of Comptroller of the Currency, the, the regulators that oversee how banks are meeting their obligations in the community. So as of late last week, this merger had yet to be approved by the Federal Reserve. And obviously this pending application is what gives activists leverage. This is the perfect time that you can sit down with banks and say, here's how we think you're doing. And they kind of have to listen. Are you worried that Mm -hmm. this relationship could shift once you lose that leverage? I'm Sarah Fenske. In October, we spoke with advocates who had serious concerns about a proposed bank merger in this region. First Mid Bank and Trust is based in Mattoon, Illinois. They were seeking regulatory approval to merge with St. Louis-based Jefferson Bank. But advocates said the Fed should block the move and look into First Mid's overall record, which they called, quote, staggeringly bad. Those groups have since changed their tune. They now support the merger because they say a few big things have changed. And joining us now with more detail on that is Elizabeth Risch. She is co-chair of the St. Louis Equal Housing and Community Reinvestment Alliance, as well as assistant director of the Metropolitan St. Louis Equal Housing and Opportunity Council. Elizabeth, welcome back. Hi, thanks for having me. So, Elizabeth, when you joined us in October, you cited, quote, significant and widespread redlining and fair lending concerns on the part of First Mid. And your groups were urging the Federal Reserve to deny this merger application. What has changed since then? Yeah, since then, the biggest thing has been that uh, we signed a community benefit agreement with First Mid. So the the CBA, or the Community Benefit Agreement, um, is between our coalition, the St. Louis Equal Housing and Community Reinvestment Alliance, or SLECRA, um, as well as our allies in um, Illinois, Woodstock Institute. And then we also worked with the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, or NCRC, um, to kind of further our um, relationship with the bank and um, you know we've been talking to the bank since October about their lending, their services and investments, not just in St. Louis, but across all of their markets, particularly to lower income communities and communities of color. And we really felt like the CBA was really meaningful, significant benefits um, that really changed and addressed kind of what the bank was doing in our underserved communities. Mm-hmm. Um, and so once we got that agreement, um, we kind of moved forward with saying that, you know, we no longer oppose this merger. So I want to talk about some of the details of that community benefits agreement here in just a moment. But before we get into the nitty gritty, I mean, you guys had some pretty tough things to say about this bank's record. When you first reached out to First Mid with your concerns last year, were they eager to sit down and and work with you on this? Yeah, we've we've had good um, meetings with the bank. And when we first kind of sat down with them, before we even submitted our first public comment letter about the merger, we had a good discussion and presented our concerns to the bank. I think what's really changed over the last couple months is the um, the really serious, significant commitments they put on paper in terms of the CBA. So it's not just talk, it's not just handshakes, it's a formal agreement um, that has some pretty significant um, and measurable changes about what's kind of going to happen with the bank over the next three years. Um, and so, you know, we've that kind of productive dialogue has been great, um, but really the difference is having a, a signed agreement. Um, that has those commitments. And so your big concerns leading up to these conversations and leading up to these agreement was that they just simply weren't serving enough low-income customers, enough customers of color. What, what was the big focus here? 
Yeah, the the um the the really big concern was their lending to to black borrowers in communities, not just in St. Louis, but also in Champaign, Illinois, and some other areas of concern. And so we looked at, you know, their mortgage lending data, we looked at branch locations, and we felt that there was a um, a lack of service and investment to black communities and black borrowers. And so that was that was kind of redlining concerns to us. You know, if you're intentionally not serving black communities, you're discriminating against um, black communities and individuals. Um, and that would be illegal under the Fair Housing Act, under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. And so that's where most of our kind of concerns were. Um, but, you know, similarly, we, we had concerns with how they were reaching low and moderate income communities. Um, and other communities of color. So that leads us to this Community Benefits Agreement, also known as a CBA. What do you see as some of the biggest wins in the agreement that they have now committed to, signed, saying they will doing, they will do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a couple kind of big highlights. You know, the the CBA has a lot in it, um, but the the really big the highlights for for me and our coalition members are locations. So you know, in an era where many banks are closing locations and branches, um, First Mid has agreed to open two new locations, one in St. Louis and one in Champaign, that are going to be located in neighborhoods um, that are low income um, or and communities of color. Um, so that's pretty significant. You know, they're opening locations, they're opening places places where people can go for bank services. Um, the lending targets, you know, they're not big dollar amounts, but the loan targets themselves, I think, are really important to show that the bank is committing to meet or exceed peers in a number of kind of targets um, across their market areas. Um, and then there's a lot of commitments around hires and personnel and how the bank is um, adding, you know, both diversity and um, racial and ethnic diversity at the bank and leaders, but f personnel that's focused on community development and focused on communities that have historically been underserved by mainstream financial services. And our coalition has really seen kind of when financial institutions hire people, when they commit to really adding you know, personnel that's dedicated to this, um, to the, to these communities, to our communities. That what's that's what really makes the difference in how banks have um, have been providing services and, and loans. And so those those are kind of some of the big highlights for me. There's also some you know monetary relief and donations um, and other financial commitments um, that we're really happy with. Kind of one to the Grio Museum that really acknowledges the history of Jefferson Bank um, and the civil rights legacy of Jefferson Bank. That all of those kind of components are 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 significant to us, and we are happy to see in the final agreement. Yeah. So Jefferson Bank this was the source of um, some very big, high-profile protests in the 1960s. So this is a history that uh, First Mid is now going to uh, ensure gets honored at, at the Griot Museum. Is that the idea there? Yeah, the idea was that we wanted to do something to really, you know, memorialize that or continue to memorialize um, that the Jefferson Bank kind of legacy. And we thought a donation to the Griot Museum um, would help kind of do some of that. And so we're, you know, our coalition has had some initial conversations with the Griot Museum about the donation. And I think we're excited about opportunities to think about programs um, and other kind of exhibits that could help to um you know, continue some of that history and that legacy of Jefferson Bank, even if it's not called Jefferson Bank anymore. And you had mentioned there's going to be a new location opening in Champaign and one opening here in St. Louis. Um, did they pinpoint what neighborhood they're going to be doing that in or just agree to a certain sort of neighborhood? Yeah, a certain sort. So by the end of the agreement, they will open a, a location that's in a low to moderate income census tract um, or neighborhood and one that also has a predominantly minority community or a community of color. So they have to kind of meet both of those conditions. So our producer reached out to First Mid uh, to hear what they think about all of this going on. And they gave us a statement. I'm going to read it in part. Um, and so this, again, is from First Mid Bank and Trust, um, which hopes to merge with Jefferson Bank. 
quote, we have found the dialogue and collaboration with the St. Louis Equal Housing and Community Reinvestment Alliance and Woodstock Institute to be productive and served as the catalyst for the Community Benefits Agreement, or CBA. We are optimistic the CBA will serve as a roadmap for our broader engagement with the community and like-minded organizations. Quote, we look forward to opening new banking center options in St. Louis and Champaign, located in low to moderate income and minority communities. We are investigating opportunities to best meet the needs in these communities and have already begun exploring potential sites. We are also open to a non-traditional branch in order to meet these needs, which could include co-locating with trusted community partners, such as libraries, churches, and community centers. Elizabeth, that seems like a really positive development there. Yeah, we're really excited about um, these kind of non-traditional banking options. You know, the days of big, you know, single standing bank branches, I think, are over. And there's some really, really positive examples of other banks in our region that have co-located in places like churches or, you know, trusted community partners or organizations. And so um, we're this was kind of one really big component to get a location and to have the bank think about some of those community partners, I think, is a really um, a, a big kind of game changer. So as of late last week, this merger had yet to be approved by the Federal Reserve. And obviously, this pending application is what gives activists leverage. This is the perfect time that you can sit down with banks and say, here's how we think you're doing. And they kind of have to listen. Are you worried that Mm -hmm. this relationship could shift once you lose that leverage? Uh, no, I mean, I think, again, the, the, the CBA is something that, um, and the process of developing the CBA kind of with the bank has been really productive um, for us as well. And so I think the, you know, the leverage that we have doesn't end after the merger is approved, but really the CBA is kind of the beginning of it. Um, and so we've seen this opportunity as a chance to sit down with the bank to to really talk about the community needs and opportunities that we have in our region and to get those commitments for them to to do things Um, but but really you know the work continues this doesn't just stop because we have a CBA I mean we have um, and had a lot of concerns with how the bank has previously operated and so the CBA I think is a is a really good opportunity for us and other community partners to continue working with this bank um, and uh, and and really uh, kind of change practices and continue to be um, really positive in our community. So there's one other piece of this I wanted to ask you about today. And as we talked about last time you were on the show, First Mid Bank and Trust actually had decent ratings from federal regulators, despite these concerns that you identified, some things that you found really troubling. Do you think there's a bigger picture here where maybe the regulators might be asleep at the wheel? Absolutely. That's, I think, really, really clear in this particular case where, you know, our our issue is also with the Federal Reserve and with the other banking regulators like the FDIC and the Office of Comptroller of the Currency, the, the regulators that oversee how banks are meeting their obligations in the community and, you know, complying with fair housing and fair lending laws. And so we, you know, still see... Um, the need to really raise the standards for how those regulators are evaluating banks. Um, they have the responsibility to issue those ratings to, to do oversight and compliance. And, and there um, is a, you know, a need for them to kind of wake up and do things a little bit different to make sure that this bank and all lenders um, and banks are kind of operating in a way that's fair and equal and really meeting the needs, reading the, meeting the, their obligations of investing in low and moderate income communities. So Elizabeth, we have a, a caller here with a question. I'm going to squeeze this in here right at the very end of our conversation here. <laughs> Kathy is calling from St. Louis County. Uh, Kathy, hi, you're on St. Louis on the air. Hi, Sarah, and hi to your guest. I would just like to know if when they sat down at the table with the bank or the entity, if uh, they lock them in, if someone else buys them out, takes them over, and if they made it irrevocable. Hmm. That's a that's a great question, Kathy. I didn't even think to ask that. Elizabeth, uh, do you know the answer to that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that really speaks to like the enforceability of our agreement. And so our agreement is with First Mid Bank and Trust. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not an attorney, but, you know, that kind of continues with the bank. And so if, if you know, if something were to happen with First Mid Bank and Trust and another entity, but kind of buys them, you know, I don't know that our agreement is effective for the 
kind of the new bank. But again, we would follow the same process of, you know, there's this leverage that we have the opportunity with a merger application to kind of talk about um, these obligations. But, um, you know, our agreement is with First Mid Bank and Trust. It's for a period of three years. And we've built in, you know, accountability and enforcement measures like you know, annual meetings, uh, a report, um, and, you know, continued interaction with, with our coalition as well as Woodstock Institute to, to keep the bank kind of accountable and uh, make sure that we're kind of meeting what we intended in the CBA. Uh, Kathy, thank you for that question. And Elizabeth, it sounds like um, while if they get bought by somebody else in that three-year span, this could be something that would become up in the air all over again. That would give you leverage to get right back to the table and you would be there. Exactly, exactly. Well, Elizabeth Risch, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Elizabeth is co-chair of the St. Louis Equal Housing and Community Reinvestment Alliance, as well as assistant director of the Metropolitan St. Louis Equal Housing and Opportunity Council. This episode was produced by Evie Hemphill, with audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. If you learned something new from today's episode, consider leaving us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the easiest way to help people discover our show. We appreciate it. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at ChooseWood.com.